Hello, welcome to our last Sunday before the new year. And actually we're recording it before the new year, but it will be programmed on. So happy new year to all of you. We're so thankful that you're here with us today. We will have, um, Miss Shirley is gonna play the piano for us today and Valerie and Dara Lee will be coming up to do the worship songs. So let's bow our head and just gather together in prayer this morning. Father, we are thankful, as always, that you are on the throne, that you are the Lord of 2020 and the Lord of 2021. Father, you can make all things good. And all, all of the trials that we've had this year, all of the tribulations that we've gone through, Father, you can make them to be good. You can make them good for us to learn from them, to grow from them, Father. We're thankful that with you in our lives, we can learn and grow from the trials that we have. And we're thankful, Father, for your son that came to earth to provide life for us, to be able to have these trials and tribulations. And we're so thankful to be here, to be able to bless others, and Father, to turn that around and bless you back. We are thankful for this day. We're thankful for a new year. And Father, we are thankful for your son. And we believe. Today is about believing and saying out loud that we believe in your Son and believe in you, Father. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Lead on, O King Eternal, is our first song. Continue on with the church's one foundation. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ through Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word from heaven. He Tumult of her war, she waits the consuming. 
you'd like to join me, I'm going to read from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the Lees have joined us for worship, and we will sing We Believe. I'm somewhat wary of what to title this, my first message of 2021. Last year, 2020, I began the year by preaching a message I titled 2020, A Year of Change. Little did I or any of us know how prophetic that title would be. And so this morning on this first Sunday of 2021, I'm going to 
to play it safe with my title, which I'll share with you in just a few moments. One of the consequences of COVID-19 was that the Summer Olympics were postponed for a year. As such, Tokyo is scheduled, and that's the key word, scheduled to host the Summer Olympics this year, beginning on July 21st. And so with this being an Olympic year, I wanted to tell you uh, the story of what many consider is the greatest comeback in Olympic track and field history. The year was 1972, the place Munich, Germany. The event is the 800 meter finals. American Dave Waddle arrived at the starting line having battled various injuries during his training. Wearing his traditional golf cap, this is what happened. When the race started, Waddle immediately dropped to the rear of the field, far back for such a short race, and he stayed there for the first 500 meters. Most, if not all, who were watching the race believed that the injuries had finally caught up to Dave. But with the finish line drawing closer with every stride, American Dave Waddle passed seven other runners. And he beat the pre-race Soviet Union runner by just 0.03 seconds and claimed the gold medal for the United States. If you've never seen the race, YouTube it. It's an exciting race. And as I viewed that race numerous times this week, I, I remained in awe of Dave Waddle's achievement. Amidst all the distractions, the crowd, his injuries, the lengthening distance between him and the other runners, amidst all the distractions, Dave Waddle never lost sight of his purpose and of his priority. Dave trained to win. Dave raced to win. Turning our attention to the New Testament, it is filled with athletic metaphors. And these metaphors describe our journey. For instance, Romans chapter, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The writer says, Wherefore, seeing also that we are compassed or surrounded about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Paul conveys this idea of, of running in Philippians chapter 2, in Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 5. But probably the passage most are familiar with comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writes, Don't you know that all which run in a race run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain or that you may win. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate or demonstrates self-control in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we that which is incorruptible. I therefore so run not with uncertainty, so fight I not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway or literally put on the shelf. One final athletic metaphor comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul was certain about his purposes and his priorities. He never lost sight of either throughout his life and throughout his ministry. And the result, well, he says in the next verse, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And so with this being the first Sunday of the year, I want us to reconsider our purposes and our priorities. And I want to do so from the perspective of the church, specifically from the perspective 
of Community Bible Church. Now, for some, this morning serves as a timely reminder. For others, the service and the message is a timely introduction. And whether as an introduction or as a reminder, the title of my message is this, CBC, Community Bible Church, Purposes and Priorities. And I want to keep things simple. I want to keep things memorable so that our purposes and priorities can be uh, summed up as easily as counting one through five on your hand. So let's begin with our purposes. Our threefold purpose is this. We seek to exalt God, to edify the church, and to extend the kingdom. Let me unpack this briefly. Seeking to exalt God literally means we want to praise God. We want to glorify God. We want to honor him and magnify him. The Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, it is a, a means, a tool for studying Bible doctrine, asks the question, what is the chief end or what is the chief purpose of man? The answer, man's chief end, man's chief purpose is to glorify, literally to exalt God and to enjoy him forever. And so we seek to exalt God in everything we say and do. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Secondly, we, we seek to edify the church, literally to build up one another, to promote spiritual growth, to strengthen. And so we ask the question, do I edify, do I build up my fellow followers of Jesus by seeking to fulfill the one another's in Scripture? In 1 Corinthians, once again, chapter 10, Paul speaking about the body of Christ, says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26. Excuse me, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but everyone another. In other words, we don't focus on our own issues. We focus to build up, to edify one another. And we do so by fulfilling the one another's. Let me just go quickly through a list. We accept one another, we admonish one another, we bear one another's burdens, we build up one another, we care for one another, we comfort one another, we confess our faults one to another, we are devoted one to another, we encourage one another, we forgive one another, we greet one another, we're honest with one another, we're hospitable to one another, we love one another, we pray for one another, we serve one another. This is just a few of the one another's. The third and final purpose, we seek to extend the kingdom of God. We seek to spread, to lengthen, to reach out. And we want to reach out with the good news of the gospel, the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God in the heart of each and every individual. Let me share this passage from the gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, the familiar words of Jesus when he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded thee. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And so our threefold purpose, exalt God, edify the church, and extend the kingdom of God. Our second priority, focuses on two great commands. Let me give you the context. In Jesus' day, Jews had 613 religious laws to follow, 248 commandments, 365 prohibitions, essentially one for every day of the year. In light of so many rules and regulations, many of the Jews were in conflict with one another. They weren't sure how to prioritize the law. Now, they come to Jesus, and we'd like to think their motive was pure in asking the question they did, but clearly Matthew 22 reveals they were testing Jesus. But it says in Matthew chapter 22, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? And so Jesus sums up the 613 
uh, laws and prohibitions of the Old Testament this way. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And so we believe in the two commandments, the two great commandments. First of all, to love God. One of my favorite Christian authors is Bob Goff. His first book was appropriately titled, Love Does. Not love thinks, not love wishes, not love hopes, not love talks, not anything, but love does. Now, my oldest son, Josh, got me the book and he had Bob sign it. And this is how Bob signed the book to my wife and I. Dear mom and dad, love God, do stuff. Bob God. See, first and foremost, we're called to love God. And then Jesus says, second of all, the second is like it to it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The two great commands, love God and love our neighbor, love one another. And how do we love one another? Once again, by intentionally fulfilling the one another's in scripture. And so we've established our threefold purpose. Second of all, we've established the two great commands. Thirdly, Community Bible Church's one passion. Now that word passion, a favorite of mine, is defined as an emotion, as a desire, as an excitement, as a fire. And the one who illustrates this best, I believe, is David in the Old Testament. I don't have time to give you the complete background to Psalm 27. Let me just summarize it by saying this. David was fleeing for his life. His son wanted to kill him. His family was separated from him. And here's David's passion, Psalm 27, verse 4. He says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. His passion was for Jesus Christ. Now, as we survey the scriptures, our passion for Jesus is to be more than our passion for our job. We see that illustrated in the callings of Peter and Andrew and Matthew 4, the calling of James and John in Matthew 4, the calling of Matthew and Luke 5. All of these left their jobs to follow Jesus. Our passion for Jesus is to be more than even our passion for our family. Hear the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. Rather radical words, but this is what Jesus says. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth sons or daughters more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus is saying that our love for Jesus is to be superior to our love for anyone else. Love for Jesus and passion for Jesus more than for our job, more than for our family, even more than for our lives. John the Baptist gave his life in Matthew 14. Stephen gave his life in Acts chapter 7. James gave his life in Acts chapter 12. See, our passion for Jesus is to be first and foremost more than for our jobs, more than for our family, even more than for our lives. We seek to fulfill our purposes. We seek to fulfill the two great commands. We seek to have one passion. Community Bible Church also has one great statement. Here it is. To be in the heart of the community, ever seeking to reach the community's heart. Why is that our one great statement? Because it follows the example of Jesus. Listen as I read from Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. And he, that being Jesus, went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitudes resorted unto him, and he taught them. And then we have the calling in verse 14 of Levi. And then notice what happens following that. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in the house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many that followed him. 
And when the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, when they saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto him, how is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? These were the least of society. And notice what Jesus says. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, what Jesus did was he went where the need was. He went where people were. That's why we say we want to be in the heart of the community. We want to go where the community is. Wherever they are, we want to go to them. Why? Because we want to seek to reach the community's heart. We want to follow the example of Jesus. We do that by serving uh, in, in our government. We do that by serving in our schools. We do that by frequenting our local businesses. We go where the people are. Once again, quick review. We fulfill our threefold purpose. We seek to obey the two great commands. We seek that Jesus is our one passion. We have our one statement to be in the heart of the community, ever seeking to reach the community's heart. And fifth and finally, we ask ourselves one question. Here it is. What am I doing today that will make a difference for eternity? See, the brevity of our lives here on earth have been described, first of all, as a shadow in First Chronicles, as a hurrying messenger in the book of Job, and as a vapor by James. Therefore, everything we do here, we do in light of eternity. There's a great teaching about this from the lips of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 31, he says, when the Son of Man shall come in glory, and then he begins to outline what will transpire. And at the end of that chapter, Jesus says this. He provides a dividing line. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Speaking of those that lost sight of eternity. Those that were not seeking to minister in the name of Jesus. They will go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous into life eternal. The separation. Here's the separation. Jesus says, it as much as you've done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. In other words, when we live our lives in light of eternity, Jesus rewards us. And when we don't live in light of eternity, we suffer eternal consequences. Those five things are threefold purpose, fulfilling the two great commands, Thirdly, having one passion. Fourth, one statement. Fifth, one question. Since I began with the Olympic illustration, it's only fitting that I conclude with one as well. And if Dave Waddle's gold medal victory is considered the greatest comeback in Olympic track and field history, let me share about the greatest finish in track and field history. The year was 1968, the location, Mexico City, Mexico. Midway through the marathon race, the runners are jockeying for position. John Stephen Aquari trips, falls. He injures his shoulder. He dislocates his knee. Suffering in great pain, having completed less than half of the race, he faces a critical decision. He knows he can no longer win a medal. In fact, he knows that if he continues the race, he will ultimately finish in last place. He gets up and he begins to continue the race. Over an hour after the winner had crossed the finish line, Akwari hobbles into the stadium. With pain etched on his face, his leg bloodied and bandaged, he slowly shuffles around the track to painfully and finally finish the race. 
when he was interviewed later and asked why he continued running, Aguari replied, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. If you individually, and if we congregationally are to finish our race, we must never lose sight of our purposes. We must never lose sight of our priorities. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the testimony of your word. We thank you even for the, the various metaphors that describe the spiritual journey. We thank you most of all that Paul continued to refer to our journey as a race. A race that had a beginning and a race that will have an ending. I pray, Father, that as we evaluate how we run the race, that, Father, we would be found faithful. That we would never lose sight of eternity. And, Father, that we would keep crystally clear our purposes, and our priorities. Father, that we would do so individually and that we will do so congregationally. And so, Father, as we move forward into this new year, let us do so with a renewed desire, a renewed commitment to fulfill the purposes that you've given to us and to ensure that our priorities are right in light of your word and in light of eternity, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
we will be in remembrance that you are the God of 2020, the God of 2021, the God of every year that comes after until Jesus comes to take us home. And we're thankful that you are with us.